It's Miss Seashell. And Mr. E. We're um, doing a video recording of Foo Ventures today due to technical difficulties. Sad face. Um, thanks for those of you that did join in <laughs> earlier and asked your questions. We will address those questions. Um, but we are here at Ledbetter Pond to the amazing cacophony of bullfrogs. Yeah, and it almost sounds like we're piping that sound in, but that's like five or six different individuals all calling back each other saying this is my territory stay out of it yeah you know some some biologists and um, herpetologists yeah. would um, not be so happy to hear those bullfrogs yeah so they're they're maybe not not supposed to be here so much there's a little bit of an invasion of the bullfrog that goes on <laughs> in a pond so um, our pond here at Oatland Island Wildlife Center is a borrowed pond so what that means is that um, the soil was dug out of it and it's now a pot so yeah. it was not made naturally mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it fills in with water with rainwater specifically and so maybe there was a little bit of a marshy area here it's a, a little depression around the pond lower elevation but it's definitely not a natural pond um, because it does and have a, a water source and that water source um, is just rainfall so this pond is only filled with rain and the rain settles and then with all the heat we have evaporation raises and lowers the depth of the pond yeah and i want you to think about ponds too like a natural versus a man-made pond yeah. the edges are going to be different because of like a bucket building it or oh, yeah. just being a gradual depression mm -hmm. and that's going to change the plant community mm -hmm. on the edges so you're going to get more if you have a natural pond you're going to have more grassy edges mm -hmm. more um, subtle slope mm -hmm. um, and that will also be a uh, improvement for a lot of wildlife so Man-made ponds are awesome. You do get lots of wildlife, but um, maybe not as much as you would get from a, a natural pond. So we want you to think about this. Put your bean caps on. How do ponds form? Yeah. So take a second and think about that. Because you probably, there's at least three animals that I can think of right off hat. There's probably more mm -hmm. that create ponds and they're just lifestyle. Yeah. So uh, earlier we were talking with some friends on Facebook Live before it glitched. And um, they, uh, Maisie came up with, um, she said beavers. Yeah. Beavers make ponds. Beavers. Yep. And Summer, she said alligators make ponds. Oh yeah. So we've, we've actually talked about alligators, how alligators make ponds, but maybe for the people that don't know how beavers make ponds, how would a beaver make a pond, Michelle? Beavers are really into engineering. Oh, they're yeah. really into dams. They're like a civil engineer. Yeah, they're very much so. Yeah. 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 And um, so they will take sticks and they'll take a, a creek, a trickling creek, and they'll block it and they'll dam it and they'll make a nice big body of water and there you have a pond. So they have to start with a stream first. Mm -hmm. They don't usually start from nothing. Yeah. Um, and beaver ponds allow a nice gentle um, sloping flow for them to go out and gather food for themselves and then also a place to raise their young. So really cool way that they kind of change their habitat. And then alligators, we've talked about how they dig with their tail and their body and that alligator wiggle that we talked about using their head and making some mud and then splashing it all out. And those wallows are really important for our swamps when they have droughts. Um, and then the other one, which Michelle um, and I think is probably one of the most interesting because it's a habitat you wouldn't think would ever have a pond is a prairie pothole. Mm -hmm. And a prairie pothole or a vernal pool in a prairie is formed by an animal that we spoke about just a little bit, uh, maybe two, three weeks ago. Yep. And they're the largest mammal yep. in North America. Land mammal, I guess. Yep, they used to roam by the millions. Yeah. So you guys know what it is? You got it. Bison! Bison, yeah, American bison. Bison, bison. bison. Fairy potholes. They make yeah. fairy potholes. So um, other things can make um, ponds such as uh, meandering creek. Um, sometimes a creek takes a sharp curve and it makes what's called an oxbow and it drops off water and leaves a little depression and then it straightens itself out and leaves that water behind and now there's a pond there. And sometimes it's a, a glacier has gone through an area like up north mm -hmm. and you get these big ice chunks carving out the land making depressions the ice melts then you have a pond yeah. um, and let's see are there any other major causes of ponds sometimes the land just sinks makes yeah. a depression yeah. we get you know some plate shifting yeah makes a pond yeah so like natural glaciation happens mm -hmm. but then also things like seismic activity like yeah. forming cracks that then fill with water as well yeah. yeah so ponds are super important for wildlife and so we're going to share with you 
um, some wildlife that absolutely have to have a pond and then there's all kinds of wildlife all around us we can hear and mm -hmm. see that use the pond as a resource yeah. for their needs. Yeah. And one of those animals is a slider. So this is a yellow belly slider. I'll try to get it as close as possible so you guys can get a good view. Just let me know. And what he's doing right now, or she, it might be a male or a female, is putting that head inside, a little bit scared, um, big scary animals all around it where we can kind of think of us as predators. That's why you grab a turtle, its head sucks inside. It's a natural defense for them. It's also really, really important to remember that this is a predator. So he has a mouth that's a beak-like and it'll grab up fish and crustaceans and insects. And we're gonna talk about where those fish and crustaceans live in the pond and kind of what levels they live at. This animal is gonna go through all the different levels of the pond, be surface feeding, then also be surface, um, moving from the surface down to all the way to the benthos, which is the bottom of the pond. He is also gonna be like actively hunting in the water column as well. So predators move throughout the pond and this is an example of that, our yellow belly slider. So we're gonna put him back in the water and get him back to where he belongs since this is a wild turtle. We'll show you the bottom pattern really quick and then flip him back over. This actually looks like a female and we can tell that because it has very short nails and those nails will actually be long and skinny if it's a male and the males will clink them together during breeding season to show off how they're a very fit individual meaning they have lots of energy to grow fingernails so long fingernails in boy turtles is actually a really good sign whereas in boys in humans it's maybe not a so great of a sign we'll all right so back. i'm going to show you another animal that is uh, wholly lively dependent on this ecosystem habitat rather habitat behind us and this is a, a froglet and it's a bullfroglet see his back legs come in first in the metamorphosis they go through they um they go from the tadpole to the adult stage but their legs in the back are the first things that come in and i'm gonna let him he like likes me i don't know why mm -hmm. he's not why aren't you leaving there he goes and then there's a whole bunch of others in here they're all um big giant tadpole bullfrog tadpoles except for this little guy he's not a tadpole i mean a bullfrog he's probably oh possibly a leopard frog it looks like a leopard frog. See him right there. Oh, oh. The things Try about, not to things hurt about them. salamanders is they're so slippery. And salamanders, salamanders. are related to our frogs because they're all amphibians with that slippery skin. Yeah. So when we think about our frogs, you think about those four legs, but that aquatic lifestyle when they're in their metamorphosis growing up from little to big. Yeah, I got the little tiny little guy here. Michelle, will you want to show off that duckweed too on your hands? Yes. Oh, we've got, got this okay, so if you, on Okay, so when your you skin. come to Oatland to visit, or if you have been to Oatland before, or actually any pond you go to, you're going to find this green mat looking thing all over the pond. Um, that is actually a very tiny, tiny flowering plant known as duckweed. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also another species. There's like two or three different species in here. It's not just one species. There's um, also, what is it called, wolf, wolf, what the name of it? Yeah, I just blanked on it too. Um, You're right with wolf though. Dog. Wolf something. Yeah. Wolf, and, not wolf weed. Um, but yeah, so this is duckweed all over our ponds. Um, it's a little bit more than we would, we would feel comfortable having just because what happens is this is um, photosynthesizing, it's making biomass, and then if it dies out, the decomposition on it is going to suck all the oxygen out of the water. Yeah, and that's not good for anything in the water no. that needs that oxygen to survive. Like all of our tadpoles that we were just exploring, like all of our species of fish that are in there, and then even the insects. So a lot of the things that we are going to show you today have gills. And so gills are really an interesting adaptation that aquatic animals have to pull oxygen out of the water. And the colder the water, the actually the more oxygen that the water can hold. And so cold, fairly clear water means that typically you're gonna have a high oxygen content. If you got a lot of 
tannins in your water, it's gonna heat up quicker and gonna lose oxygen quicker. So actually the mat of duckweed does provide some cover, a little anhinga flying through, it's pretty cool. Um, and that actually does apply a little bit of shade, maybe keeps a little bit of oxygen, but as Michelle said, if we get a big die off of that, it can cause big problems. It can cause really, really bad um, eutrophication. Anoxic conditions. Anoxic conditions. Anoxic means an oxygen. No, no oxygen. oxygen. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, it is uh, definitely can be a problem. And the way we deal with it is we do treat it sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure what we treat it with. And we keep the pumps running, um, aerating the water and moving it around. And that helps out too. Yep. We turn the pumps off yep. so we could talk to you in the video. But They're when you, a little loud. When you come, you'll know what we're talking about. They're like fountains in the middle of yeah. the pond that you'll see. Yep. So, and that um, leaves open areas and also a lot provides circulation, which is a good thing for the pond. Yeah, and I think in the very beginning, they used to um, go in with a little boat and tow nets and try to scoop it out like that. So, Yeah, you can manually remove duckweed. It's, the thing is, it's going to reproduce even if there's little one little tiny one left. Yeah. And a lot of people think this is a thing that is introduced, but a lot of times it's not introduced by humans by boats moving from place to place or by um, you know getting on your shoe and then you step in a different body of water it's come on the feet of ducks that's why it's called duckweed oh and guess what eric what you can eat it oh yeah and it's uh, it's biomass it's i wouldn't good eat for it you. i wouldn't eat it like pick it no. up and eat it yeah that's <laughs> don't do that but in some countries they do prepare it and yeah. they say it tastes like watercress yeah and so it's it's a it's a food item and it Lots of animals eat it, mm -hmm. um, ducks and geese eat it, lots of waterfowl eat it, and then, you know, it also provides habitat and shelter. So mm -hmm. even though it might look a little unsightly, it might look like a big green cement out there that you could walk on, it's definitely water underneath and it's so much life underneath. And Michelle's got some examples of that life yeah. for you right in front of her, and so she's going to probably get a little closer so you can get okay. a Okay, so um, this was a find I made this morning. Um, this is a, a giant water bug. See him right here swimming around. Isn't that amazing how he looks like a leaf? Just so unbelievable. And he's a predator and there's a fish. And um, probably he's stressed right now, but that would be good bait, good food for him if he were to, if he were hungry. That's a little tiny, ooh, probably a gambusia or a mosquito fish. Lots of little tiny fish in our pond right now. We had a major die off. They say there was a thermocline. Mr. E was talking about how much cold water can hold so much more oxygen than warm water. And so what happens is the water, um, the water levels will be um, they mixed where you'll have the warm water on top and the cold water on the bottom, or they'll flip and then, then they'll have the warm water on the bottom and there's no oxygen there. So you have a lot of animals die off because they're, they're suffocating pretty much. So we did have a major fish kill and it was just a normal thing that happens cyclically in nature. Um, a lot of ponds were experiencing it at that time because of our hot summer that we were having and our drought. Um, but the little fish are coming back. And so we, are, we have little fish in our pond right now. But one day when you visit our pond, there may be big fish in there again. So we have a giant water bug and a little tiny mummy, a mosquito fish possibly. Um, we caught with our nets earlier. Mystery's gonna bring over some uh, some other benthos. Benthos is a, a ha micro habitat. That's, that means the bottom. So there are lots of habitats out here. You have the surface, the edges, the middle where they swim around, and you have the bottom habitats. And this is this is a um, an animal that Mr. E caught earlier, and he caught it with his finger. <laughs> it grabbed him. So. We are still looking this organism up because we think we thought it was a Helgramite, but he has very interesting gills at the bottom of his tail. If you can see those right there, um, very big mouth parts, and Mr. E got snagged by him. So you can see he is an insect. You can tell because he has six legs, and that is the magic number for an insect: six legs. So this is a bottom-dwelling benthos um, predator yeah. hunting for small insects. Yeah, and actually, when we weren't watching, he crawled out of his container and actually was predating this oh. 
this dragonfly larva. Oh, no. Super, super sad, but um, that's the circle of life, right? So this dragonfly larva was grasped by his pinchers and he was consuming it. So pretty amazing. Um, as soon as I touched the dragonfly larva, he let go. But this is a dragonfly larva, super cool um, insect larva called a naiad. And the naiad is actually the stage of life that lasts the longest in the dragonfly family. A dragonfly may be underwater in its larval stage for two to three years before it comes out as an adult. And that adult might only live for a week to a couple months, maybe um, two to three weeks is kind of the average. Um, what's really interesting about dragonflies though is that in both stages of their life, so as a larva and then as an adult as well, they're going to eat mosquitoes. Yay! So, dragonflies! So Woohoo! They are, you know, we just pat them on we the back. We love them! We give them cheers. Their we whole shout, life cycle. We shout hooray. When you have a freshwater source that has a, a defined vegetation layer that is really, really um, like nice um, in regards to its uh, water temperature, it's well established, it doesn't dry out, you can get larva in there and then the adults will hatch out and lay their eggs back in that same spot. And if you continue that cycle, then we reduce the amount of mosquitoes we have because they eat both the adults and the larva. If we have open areas that aren't continually maintained, or if they're little puddles, or they're inside of a tire, or they're a hole in your backyard, or a five gallon bucket, or an uncleaned bird bath, all those things can grow mosquitoes, but they can't grow dragonflies. dragonflies. Sad face. And so then we have an imbalance and we have a lot more of our mosquitoes because there's not enough dragonflies to eat them all. So, yeah. so natural balance is important um, yeah. in our environment. Yeah. Um, so both of these insects, uh, their larval stages, just so you know, are going to metamorph into an, a, a flying, yeah. um, air-dwelling insect. Yeah, six so legs, is, wings. This, this is possibly a Dobson fly. Yeah, and I think it's probably a species of Helgramite. I just wasn't able to specifically yeah. identify the species. It's not an eastern Dobson fly which is the common one that we find around here that has the, the many looking legs in the sides, but those projections aren't actually legs, they're actually gills. And you can see the gills yep. in the tail of this individual, uh, but the, the legs are up at the front and they have three pairs of legs, six legs, because they are an insect. Eventually they'll hatch yeah. out and fly around. Except for the giant water bug I showed you. They're, they're life aquatic, right? They're fully aquatic, yeah. They're, yeah, yes. they're not gonna yeah. metamorph into a flying Yeah, they live their whole predator. entire life in the water. Yeah. Um, they go through a, a bit of metamorphosis. That's actually a fairly small one. They'll get actually much live larger, two to three inches long sometimes. Yeah. Super crazy. Call them toe biters sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a fun nickname. Yeah. How cool. many people swim in ponds like they did up? Well, I'm from Vermont and people swim in ponds all the time up there. Oh, the things you don't know are going on in there. All right, so um, we're here at Ledbetter Pond, and if you want to come closer, I, I've been watching the surface. You can watch the dragonflies dancing, chasing each other. You might have to zoom in and look at nothing for a second, and you will start to see that the surface is alive with all kinds of dragonflies hunting and flirting with each other, trying to catch each other. Yeah, we have ducks in our pond right now, too. We just had a pair of black-bellied whistling ducks um, pull, fly in and land, and they're a little bit too far from you to see, but when you come to Ledbetter Pond, look for a tall-legged duck with red beak and red feet, or red legs. Can't remember at the moment. Red legs. Red legs. Pink is red, yeah. Yeah. Kind of the diagnostic, the way you see it and know it's what it is. It's by its beak and legs. Yeah, so dragonflies are all over the surface of our pond here. We got cicadas singing. Cicadas singing, we heard a uh, really, 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 really loud mouth hummingbird earlier that was screaming at us. Um, seen then hingas fly in, and then there was a lot of, um, you know, action with the fresh water being here. Everything comes to get a drink as well. We've also seen alligators here, which is super cool. Um, wild alligators can smell the fresh water and they, they find this place. And we let them hang out here and we know that 
as people that live in the South, we can live with gators and we can be peaceful with them and we can respect them and give them space. And so if we follow those rules, they're usually fine. There's a vulture that just flew in. Oh, That's pretty vulture. cool. Just came in. Um, so really, I want to talk about plants, vegetation oh, on yeah, a pond plants. real quickly. Um, so mostly uh, we have these little islands right here. And at one point in time, there was a rookery there. That means a breeding ground for, there goes a vulture. That's a turkey, turkey vulture. So we had a black vulture here and a turkey vulture here. I wonder if he's following that turkey vulture around. Um, the island that you see in the middle of our pond used to have a bunch of nests of wood storks until about, ooh, what week was that? April, first week of April, second week of April, we had a big wind storm. And oh, so sad, knocked the eggs out of the tree and the birds kind of just gave up and have not come back since. Yeah, but we, maybe one day you'll come here and there will be a uh, just beautiful display of birds nesting on that, that once rookery. Um, but, but in this vegetative island, we have red maples, we have sweet gums, all on the edges we have plants like this button bush. I love this plant. This yeah. is a, um, a native pollinator plant. If you're wondering what kind of pollinator plant to, that if you have a little wet area around your house mm -hmm. to put in, this is it. This is what you want to put in. Buttonbush has these really beautiful, um, I think of like truffula tree flowers, mm -hmm. um, or somebody say coronavirus looking flowers. <laughs> it's not a good way to look at it. Um, and the leaves are opposite of each other. This is a fantastic native pollinator plant. The insects love to come and um, get the pollen out of these. Yep. And so you're supporting native pollinators by planting this and you're putting a native plant that's naturally here in the ground. And that's what we want to do. We don't want to introduce invasives. Yep. All in the pond, all around the edges are, is a very invasive plant called alligator weed. Yep. And that plant is taking over. And um, unfortunately it's going to like kind of suffocate and choke out. So anywhere you see along edges and you see this plant floating in the water, that is um, an invasive plant. Mr. E, we got some work to do. Yeah, and so the plan with the alligator weed is to use um, rakes and kind of like giant treble hooks um, to grab onto these mats of floating vegetation and pull them up on land. Um, once they're up on land, they're removed from the water source. As long as it's not a really swampy area, they'll actually get killed off by this, just the heat of the sun. Um, they need, they're very vascular, they need a lot of water. So we can get them up on the banks, they can die off, and then we can remove kind of these mats. And those mats can actually allow access to our middle of our pond in that island area for predators and things like that. So the more we remove it away, the more likely it is that our, our rookery will kind of bounce back. Um, like Michelle said, with those storms, with the high winds that we've had, uh, our rookery was damaged. And then through past storms and hurricanes, we also lost some of the large trees that they would nest in on that island as well. So as the smaller trees grow back up, hopefully we'll have a return of that um, rookery. Because up until this year, we'd have successive growing years of our rookery, more and more and more nests. So we hope to have that continue um, for 2021. Yeah. But um, our pond is just a wonderful place if you are a bird watcher, mm -hmm. bring your binoculars because it's not just necessarily like wading birds that you're gonna see. Um, I've been hearing woodpeckers the entire time. We just heard hummingbirds, yep. um, nuthatches, um, flycatchers. There were kingbirds king here birds. Yeah. That, yesterday. That was awesome. Um, ducks, we think of water birds, but. Yeah, all of our heron species can be seen here. Lots of really cool interactions between um, kind of our great egrets and our snowy egrets that come and feed here. So really cool um, area for to see a lot of wildlife interaction because of the, the food sources that are here basically. Yeah, um, and, and also like the diversity of habitats yeah. that we have in one little area is also going to promote wildlife too because we're on edges, right? We're on edges of all yep. these different habitats. Fringe. We're on the edge of a marsh and that's got to have certain birds and certain animals there, but they might need a little fresh water every once in a while. So they'll fly over here. And so Summer asked us earlier, was this fresh water, was this a brackish water sometimes? Oh, yes. And so we just want to let you know that this water is fresh water. It is hot, um, it's, it's, an, it's a depression, but the bank's edges are high enough that there's really never been a spillover. Because mm -hmm. if there was a spillover, you would see vegetative die off because mm -hmm. plants, have to be really well adapted to living in salt water. Yeah. 
And yeah. Spartina Alterna Flora is really good at it. Yeah. But other ones are not so good at it. Yeah. Um, so um, this is fresh water. And so we're here on the on a fresh water source, mm -hmm. a salt water source, and then forests yeah. all around us. Yeah, so many habitats very close by. So lots of animals utilizing this area, moving in and out of that fringe habitat, that edge habitat that's really, really important. We also have a really amazing view of the sky here. So at Oatland, you know, at least, you know, two years ago, we had such a huge canopy, you couldn't see the sky. Now it's a little bit depleted from some of our storms. But typically, when you can't see the open sky, you can't see all those amazing soaring birds. So um, right now we can look up and see our Mississippi kites and our swallowtail kites. We can see bald eagles, red-tailed hawks, all sorts of vultures up there. So osprey. another uh, osprey, another great place where there's open sky where you can view animals coming in, circling the forest, finding perching spots. <gasps> very, very cool. Guess what? Let's what? tell them about what's coming soon. To oh yeah, our so super exciting. Coming soon, uh, we're going to have a viewer. Um, basically a built-in set of binoculars. Is it going to be free or a cost? It's going to be completely free. You guys are going to be able to utilize it to look at a distance and see things close up. So very, very exciting. We'd like to thank Friends of Oatland Island who is helping out with um, the funding for that. They're super, super supportive of us. And then also our DNR, um, Georgia DNR is uh, part of a grant system that we've gotten for viewing wildlife. Um, is going to be using some of that for our signage and our interpretation. So new signage, new yes. viewer, super exciting um, that that's all happening. So um, yeah, we're super excited for people to visit. I don't like. I know. It's like, come on, we got all this new stuff. We want you to utilize. You know, it's this is this <laughs> pond is really a treasure at Oakland yeah. Island because yeah. um, you're walking along and you're seeing all these exhibits and you're um, you know you're expecting to see animals that are confined and yeah. contained. And then all of a sudden, bam, here is a wild, open, free opportunity to see special finds mm -hmm. because we don't know what's going to be here, right? We've mm -hmm. seen the um, roseate spoonbills yep. here before. Roseate spoonbills down here. Um, a lot of times if uh, I have a little bit of an extra minute, come sit here, take a few calming breaths, and just let the pond come back to life. It's a little bit of a noisy walk up on the platform coming up here. You're a little clunky clunky, but if you sit down, let mm -hmm. things quiet down, everything starts coming back and you'll see lots of animals. Re something's really interesting is like, especially in the spring of the year, you'll see raccoon mamas coming down and getting food for their babies, calling, going around the edges of the pond. With the viewer, you can kind of scan the edges to see all the different wildlife. A lot of times the alligators are up there. Mm -hmm. Possums. Um, oh, I've seen opossums or evidence of <laughs> opossums coming here. So we do have um, wildlife coming in that are using the pond as a freshwater source. That was a green heron making yeah, that crazy, crazy sound. Um, using it as a freshwater source and also as as a hunting ground, yeah. right? There's lots of opportunity. So raccoons actually are pretty devastating to a rookery. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah. what? How do the birds in the rookery get around that? Yeah. So we t we talked about the pond, right? And the pond has an island, and what a rookery needs, or what it usually is built around, is the idea that we have standing trees surrounded by water. So, um, in some areas, like in the Okefenokee Swamp, we have amazing, massive rookeries because there's water all around them. And as you guys may know, the Okefenokee Swamp is also home to a lot of Sorry, I'm zoning out because there's an animal trying to escape your container. <laughs> alligators. Alligators. And alligators are everywhere in the Okefenokee. And because they're everywhere and because they're all over the place, what happens is those act as a natural deterrent to nest predation. Because what an animal would have to do was cross over the water to get to the tree, to climb up into the tree to get the to the nest. And so because we don't have that happening, because that's not a uh, uh, active thing that a raccoon wants to do when there's water um, that is full of alligators, we get this really, really interesting um, kind of symbiotic relationship where the alligator benefits from maybe a baby bird that falls out of a tree and the baby birds benefit from their nest being protected so a raccoon doesn't come in and eat all of the eggs or the helpless baby. So really cool, um, interesting kind of um, kind of protection I guess um, that they provide which is not maybe purposeful but also is a really good result because they know where to build their nest they know where a safe spot is
Yeah. Super cool. Super cool. I think the coolest fact about the, the nest though is that sometimes when the rooker gets a little bit crowded, they'll build on the back and we actually um, have like land with tall pines there. When they build there, those nests are not nearly as successful as the ones that are surrounded by water because they have more nest predation. So yeah. really cool. I think we're, we're about wrapping up. We know that um, this is a little bit different than normal because it's not live. And so we'd like to have you guys comment please on this video after you're watching or while you're watching and we will come back and we will ask any of your questions that you might have. And, and also please tell us what you've seen special finds yourself in your, yes. in your days or times if you've visited us before. Give us, um, give us your information. We love that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's all about learning. So what you're curious about, we want to know. I want you to stay curious, too. Yeah, so we want to just thank again uh, our friends of Oatland Group for being such champions yep. and trying to make this happen um, and bring education to you. Yeah, Because we sure. miss you. Thanks, guys. Be safe.